uh, what we've done on this is, oh, sorry, what we've done on this is we've, we've talked about three basic things. I probably need to change this chart as I have uh, be begun to change a couple of things in the way I present this. The material hasn't changed, but there is a difference between the special and general theories of evolution. What's the special theory? What's the term people use for that? Natural selection. All right. And the general theory is kind of the uh, single cell up to humans kind of change. And we'll talk more about that tonight. I, I've tried to make people make these distinctions. And I don't get to the idea of life from non-life till I get down here. So you really have three. So what's the first one if you were thinking about these in a sequence? What's the first thing that would have to happen? Hey, guys, good to see you. What's the first thing that would have to happen? Life from non-life. Non There's a big term for that if you want to impress people. It's called abiogenesis. I'm sorry. Abiogenesis. I'll be impressed. <laughs> anyway, life from non-life. So once you get the original cell, uh, then the idea is that they're thinking that through natural selection you can get these changes and they would just build up and build up over time through the general theory of evolution until you go from a single cell to the most complex or organisms that li all the organisms that live today. So you have general, special, uh, and you have, uh, excuse me, you have chemical, general, and special evolution. And I can't emphasize enough that you learn to make the distinction because when somebody uses the word evolution, they have a very specific thing in mind, you know, and generally they're talking about general evolution, okay? But if they're talking about natural selection, which is almost every example of general evolution that I've ever seen in my textbooks is one of natural selection. So if there's really a difference between those two concepts, we are going to have to be the ones who make the distinction. So I, I've just said before, and I don't, I don't always, I'm not always able to do this. Sometimes I make the same mistake I tell people not to make. But when you hear the word evolution, you need to say in your mind, what are they talking about? And when you use the word evolution, if you are, if you are bothered about the general theory, say the general theory. All right. And the other thing that I've tried to emphasize to you is, that if somebody says, are you an evolutionist or a creationist, you're going to answer, yes, I am. Because you really believe some of both of those. All right, so uh, that way you've, you're going to have another discussion with them if you do that. If, if, if you just say creationist like people have done for years and years, you will not have another discussion with them. Because when you say that, you, they're going to say, huh? And then if you explain it to them, you, you've got an opportunity to teach. So those are three things that I've emphasized. Um, so if you look at general theory, you basically have to have a natural creation. You have to have the world, I mean, the universe itself creating itself and life creating itself. I mean, it just doesn't happen that way. There's never been observed ever. It will never be observed because it was a one-time kind of thing if it happened that way. So for somebody to say that it's proven uh, is not scientifically valid. You can't say that. It, it, it has not been proven in any way, shape, or form. So people can theorize all they want, but they have never seen it happen, and they will never see it happen. Now, once you get life, if you want to believe the general theory and go from single cell to all the things, the top of this is kind of modern times. All of the things that exist today, that you have a right to do that. But there's a lot of problems with that. We're going to talk more about that tonight as we go through the fossil record. If you are following what I'm saying, the, the kinds are what God said would reproduce after one another. He never used the word species. Most of the uh, creationist organ organizations believe that the kind is the species, period. And they will, they will allow for certain variation. But in essence, what they're saying is everything was created as it is and where it is from the beginning. 
and it doesn't show up that way. I mean, it's very clear that some species have broken into other species. That's how you explain Darwin's uh, finches. 13 species, I grant them 13 species. There may not be 13 species, but I don't argue about the number. I just say I can see a pair, you know, blowing off into these islands, and because they're separated, they could turn into 13 species. That doesn't violate anything about the Bible, because the Bible talks about birds at the superfamily level, which would have subfamilies and orders and uh, genera underneath that, and many species. So you could change species within that kind without violating anything that is said in the Bible. Although the thing that has, I think, kind of drawn people that direction is this problem of man being a kind and a species. And, and that there's no doubt about that. We are one blood. We'll come back to that too. So what I'm saying is that mankind and horse kind and ape kind and so all of that were created in the beginning as kinds and they have evolved except for man. We are still the same. Now there's a reason why that happened. It's really a very logical reason. I'm going to say it again. Uh, Linnaeus, who is the father of modern taxonomy and classification and all of the things that you see up there, uh, he was a very strong Bible believer. But he his logic was, if God is all-powerful and perfect, he would have created everything without any possibility of change. Now, I understand the logic of it. I just, it's not supported by the Bible. And that's where it all started, and it, that idea is still around today. You just need to understand that. It's still around. And most of the creationist groups, including the ones that you were studying uh, out of their materials, still hold that view. And uh, I say this from firsthand experience because when I was at the University of Florida, I had the chance to sit down privately and talk with Henry Morris, who was the founder of the Creation Research Society, one-on-one. -on -one. And at that time, John Clark and I had put together these basic ideas, and it actually sent a paper down to the president of the University of Alabama at his request about our particular way of viewing it. And, you know, we talked, and after a while, uh, I was talking about both special and general evolution, and Dr. Morris basically just said, yeah, but the guys at the Institute don't believe that that happens. And that was the end of the discussion, the guys at the Institute. And, and I believe it's for religious reasons. And you need to understand that a lot of this is actually motivated by religious reasons. I'm just trying to get you back to what I see being said in the Bible, and I hope that I've presented it in a way that has been clear, particularly that if you go back and continue to study uh, Genesis 30 and 31 with that story of Jacob and Laban, it is what happened when Laban began to change his wages uh, that Jacob recognized that a miracle was going on because he knew enough about the natural breeding to know he wasn't getting what he ought to get, that God was helping him. So he recognized the miracle, all right? And you, you can't recognize a miracle if you don't know what's going on naturally, can you? You can't see the supernatural if you don't understand the natural really well. So anyway, um, these are just the definitions again, and I don't need to go through those. But basically, this is the idea, you know, you have horse kind and fern kind and carnation kind. I, that could be roses. Who knows? Frog kind and doggy kind and people variations. You know, the, uh, mankind is clearly a species. And I think that God did it that way for a reason. Man was unique out of all of the things that God created. Man was unique. And here's the general theory, the idea that all the living forms arose from a single source, which came from an inorganic, which means dead. Uh, and that's a general theory. All right, so I still love those. And this is, the, this is what students get in their textbooks, that all life evolved from some single organism, some single cell, some place in a soupy pre- uh, you know, 
prehistoric uh, soup of a what would you call a sea? All right, not like a sea we have today. So anyway, uh, that's this is the general theory right here in a nutshell. Okay, uh, this is an old chart of the geologic table, and I don't I don't make any uh, apologies for using this old chart because when they're drawn today. They don't put in the things that are on this chart. And I think it's very important that you notice that between these major groups, there are dotted lines. What do you think those dotted lines mean? There's no, there's no fossils. There's nothing to support that. And that is not the way that it's drawn today, I can tell you that. And they don't talk about this. We're going to talk about this in a minute. Uh, what's called the cryptozoic or the hidden life. You know, a crypt is where you put something and hide it from your view. And uh, a cryptic message, like, I don't like David Bassett. <laughs> That's a cryptic message. As long as I don't get a hold of it, then it's not cryptic anymore. It's just an insult. So anyway, uh, here's the distinction again. Uh, this has helped my wife the most. If you look at the idea of a kind, in the special theory, you have variation within the kind. I've tried to uh, explain it more like the idea that you, you're on a bungee cord, you know, and you can go out and you can push away and you can make a lot of changes and you might even make some new species. But at some point, there's a snapback or you die. And none of the things that you change radically. Uh, will ever survive in the wild. And that's something that's not always told to our students. So you have the kinds with variation within the kinds, but the general theory requires you to go from one kind to another kind to another kind to another kind. So you go from single cell to multicellular, multicellular to fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, that kind of thing. So it's that kind of a progression. Now, all of that is really a little bit of review. I talked about the fact that I believe that mankind is different. I have loved this particular uh, cartoon by Hardin because every other organism looks for food to survive so they can reproduce. That is the purpose of their life. All right. All they do is look to find food so they can survive and pass their genes on. They don't think about it as passing their alleles or their genetics on to their offspring, but that's what's happening, okay? And then you get to man. Well, what's it all about, Alfie? There's only a few people here who know that particular comment. It's out of a movie. Uh, but what's it all about? I mean, what other organism can sit and reflect on its own death? Or make decisions and say, I don't really care what people think about how I live. I'm going to go and I'm going to shoot all those people at that newspaper because I hate them. And I'm going to make it really messy because it'll be more fun that way. You know, only humans seem to have this ability to find, uh, find some kind of joy in killing. They can decide to kill for no other reason than to kill. Not for food. So... Uh, I added this one in, the uniqueness of mankind. Outside of the, all of the similarities that we might look at, what makes us different is that we're the only species, species that can decide to kill for fun, and we are the only species that is known to be able to reflect on their own death. There's no other species that has ever been shown to be able to. There's a little bit of reflective thinking that's there, but... Nothing of the order of being able to reflect on the fact that you will die someday. I just, they don't have that in there. They either live or they die. And they're not thinking about it. Okay? So there's something very, very unique about mankind. So in paleontology, the evidence is rare, is fairly simple, although you, I had trouble finding this one statement in my books. Uh, you know, and that is that some rocks have fossils in them. It's never been, <laughs> not in any textbook that I know of, so I wrote my own. <laughs> just, it's an ego problem. I just wrote my own out because this
This is what it boils down to, that some rocks have fossils in them. Not all rocks have fossils in them. In fact, most rocks have no fossils in them. At least five-sixths of the Earth's crust is made up of rocks that have no fossils in them. All right? And although most fossils, uh, although most fossils are found in sedimentary rocks, like, uh, you know, they floated down a stream and they drop into the Gulf of Mexico and they go to the bottom and they get covered up and then it gets pressed into rock, they are also found in terrestrial deposits in lakes and streams. So you can go down and you can core through the bottom of a lake and you can find a lot of information on changes in the environment around that lake by the kinds of plant and animal pollen and all sorts of stuff that you find. And not animal pollen. <laughs> animal, plant and animal remains. Let me clarify that one. All right. Now, the promise of paleontology is fairly simple, and that is that the history of life stops being a hypothesis or a guess and it, or an inference, it becomes direct knowledge when fossils are available. That's straight out of uh, Simpson and Beck's book on life. Uh, that's a very clear statement, okay? And that's the promise that paleontology makes. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through this and see whether the promise has been fulfilled or whether there are enough problems to, to have a question about it. So again, this is the chart that is in almost, how, kids, how many of you all, how many people have seen that chart before? Let's just do it that way. Okay. You can raise your hand unless you didn't shower. We're, we're okay with that. Everybody's seen that before someplace. It's just everywhere. So the question is, uh, where do we find the fossils? Well, they're everywhere. You know, there's a lot of geology, and the geology to me is really quite fascinating. I don't interpret it the same way, but I find it quite fascinating. You know, if you look at a puddle and then there's a mud flow and you see little streams through the mud, it's going to look a lot like the earth from 35,000 feet. There's just no question about that. Uh, now, here's the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon uh, supposedly has about a billion and a half years of, of uh, evolution occurring. And so how do, you, how do you talk to somebody about that particular issue? So uh, we're back to this thing. There's two things I want to point out about this. One is these gaps, and the other is this cryptozoic. And then I'll come back to that. So let's talk about how a fossil actually gets formed. Oldest fossils are on the bottom. That's technically what ought to happen. It's the law of superposition. You know, the first stuff that flowed down the stream as the mountain was eroding was the oldest stuff. And then it, the, old, you know, the more the mountain comes down, you've got newer animals, and they're on top. And then, you know, the latest ones are on top. So that's the law of superpos superposition. And it's not a whole lot different than if I ask you to find a newspaper from a month ago. You've thrown them all up. You put them out in the garage in a big stack. The oldest ones are on the bottom and you work your way up. It's that same concept, okay? So the question is, is that what we find? Uh, in geology by uh, Van Engen and Castor from Cornell, this is their statement. Uh, the difficulty, people have asked me to put this down in writing. And the difficulty is you are seeing the revelation says they came to me through my whole career. And I've picked various images because they reflect what I was learning at that time. And I set out to never use any quote or image that did not come from a general evolutionist. I was trying to be as fair as I could possibly be. And in many cases, I grant things that other creationists would scream and yell about. You know, like Darwin's finches, you know, there's not that many species. That's off the track. The point is, does it happen at all? You know, and that's what I'm shooting for. So this is not written by a creationist. But if you look at the principle of superposition, okay, if you had a pile using uh, every geologic age 
you'd have it about a hundred miles deep or high. I didn't say that. That came from geologists. All right. And you don't find that any place on the face of the earth. In fact, there's almost, I don't believe there's any place on the face of the earth where you can find the entire column represented from the earliest to the oldest. I mean, the oldest, the oldest to the newest. Okay. It just doesn't exist. So, uh, the question then is, what do you do when you have them? Well, let's see. Part of the deck is over there. Part of the deck is over there. Part of the deck is back there. How do you put the cards back together? How many people have ever played that clever little game called 52 card pickup? One time. <laughs> You've played that one time, and then it was so embarrassing <laughs> that you fell for it. All right, so somebody shoots the cards all over the place. So when you pick them up, all right, probably you just shove them together because you're embarrassed. But after a while, you got to put them back together. So how do you put them back together? How would you put them back together? Do you do them by suits? Do you? How, how do you put a deck of cards back together again? How'd it come to you? Yeah, each each suit is numerically down there. Why? Wait a minute. Is the ace the first or the last? Is everybody? <laughs> I got people shaking their head no in the back here. So I. The, well, the pro the problem with it is that it's purely a matter of interpretation. Now, if I shot a deck of fifty two cards in the air that had nothing on it, what would you do to put them back together? You just put them together. You'd have a deck of cards with no markings on it. So there has to be some kind of marking that they're looking for, and that's the important of fossils. That's the importance of fossils to this whole thing. I want you to notice uh, this is this may be out of a creationist book, but it was pictures actually taken, poor pictures actually taken in Wyoming and in Montana. All right, uh, and what this is is this is the way it ought to be, okay? There is this part down here. They use so many different words over, over the years that would be pre-Cambrium or, or uh, crypto, cryptozoic. And then here's the Cambrium. And you go on up until you get to the earliest ones. And if you will look at this, you have all sorts of ones that are out of shape. So look at this one that has the Cambrium on top of what's called the tertiary. Now, it's not the way it's supposed to be. You're talking about huge slabs of rock, and they're not in the order that they ought to be in, and everybody knows that. You know, this is stuff uh, out of the United States, and this is stuff uh, uh, that also includes Alberta and Switzerland, but you can just see that there's a crossing over where older rock is on top of younger rock, and younger rock is on top of older rock, and there's pieces missing out in between. And so they're just scattered out like that, and trying to make sense out of it, you have to have a marker. So what would the marker be? It would be the fossils within those layers of rock, all right? And it would not be all the fossils in that layer of rock. They look for uh, indicator species. They're, they're looking for a a very clear set of 10 to 15 indicator species, they ignore all the rest of them. There's some logical reasons for that, but the point is that you can't really build that fossil structure, you can't build that column without having a very strong view of what those fossils represent and having fossils in them. And the reason that I say that, whoops, uh, well, I'm just going to go on with this. This is from Carl Dunbar. This is Outlines of Historical Geology. Earth history is not recorded in a single outcrop or in one continent. The records from many regions must be pieced together in their proper order until we have the composite sequence of events. That's not a creationist statement. Hence, you see why I went this direction. It's all right there in the books. All right, so... Here it is again, geologic time scale. Now, uh, 
John Clark and I put this together. Really, John put it together. But there's really three things uh, that resulted in this, this thing here uh, in the column. One is to the geologist, evolution, you can come back and tell me in a minute which we're talking about, is a fact. It's not a theory, even though not all the causes of evolution are known. All right. Now, you might wonder why I put in Barnes & Noble College Outline Series, because when I was at the university, we didn't have Google. You know, we didn't have Yahoo. We had some Yahoos, but we didn't have Yahoo, okay, or Ask. So those are really amazing things. The Barnes & Noble College Outline Series would take the top 25 books in geology that were being used in the university, and it would simplify them like, Geology for dummies. It's really that same kind of thing. Nobody likes to say that. And then they would key each section to the part of the book where it was in those textbooks. Pretty ambitious, actually, and very helpful to those of us who are in school. And so this is, in essence, something that was said as a, geolo in, as a geologist in this geology book that is keyed to 25 geology books, which means that all of those geology books held that same concept. The second thing is you can't do it without fossils. You have to use fossils, or you don't have the details of geologic history. They couldn't have ever been, oh, pieced together. We're back to the pieced together thing again. And the doctrine of uniformitarianism. Uh, this is a fairly simple concept. Uh, if you think about a mountain being built or a mountain being eroded down. Uniformitarianism basically says if you watch a mountain being eroded down today, every time a mountain was eroded down, it happened at the same pace. It was uniform. And the rates were uniform. It's always been that way. It will always be that way. And that's the idea of uniformitarianism. So you have very slow changes over a long period of time, all right, with no abrupt changes. That's how they decided to do it. There's, there is no such thing as a flood. There's no such thing as an abrupt creation. They just eliminated that from their thinking. If you've seen one mountain being eroded down, you know what all mountains have done. You know everything about the face of the earth from what you see today. All right, now, they would say to me that I was fairly arrogant if I made that statement, all right, about anything about life, all right. But they do it all the time when it comes to geology. So you have to, you have to apply this doctrine of uniformitarianism. Now, I'm not going to make a big deal about it, but I'm just going to tell you that they have abandoned it, even though they don't want to really say that they've abandoned it. They don't come right out and say, we don't believe they have too many exceptions that they found that, that just defy the concept of uniformitarianism. So really, they don't follow this anymore. All right, but I would say that most students do not know the difference well enough to see where that change is in the lectures they get. So these, these are really the, the result of it. And without the fossils, there is no way to put those rocks in an order, okay? Uh, so talked about that. Uh, this, if you go back to the general theory, the idea that all the living forms arose from a single source, that would be the general theory. So we're talking about the general theory, and those quotes were about the general theory, right? I forgot to ask you. They are about the general theory. So what is it about this that I like? First of all, I like the fact that they show dotted lines where there were no fossils. All right. And the second thing is down here. You cannot read it very well, but I'm going to just say this. <clears throat> if, if you look at this as one-sixth of the rock on the earth, the other five-sixths is down there. So you take that and you put five more underneath it. All of that has no fossils. You know, they, it's, everybody always gets this idea that any place you look, at a sedimentary rock or a limestone rock, you're going to find fossils. And those are the only ones. You know, just a limestone or a sandstone, and we have it all over Kentucky, right? 
we borrowed as much as we could from everybody and stuck it all over Kentucky. But, you know, limestone and sandstone is just sand or dirt with the fossils in it. And if you look at these road cuts, a lot of that you see that is rock has stuff in between it that is not rock. And you can actually scrape fossils out just by scraping on it. I always recommend you do that in the fall because after the winter, with freeze and thaw, there's a lot of stuff ready to fall on you. I would not do it without a helmet on, and I, <clears throat> I would not, I would not try rock climbing in the in the spring after all the freeze and thaw. The reason for that, by the way, is these little fine cracks that you don't think anything about when they get water in them and they freeze. They're being pushed apart ever so slightly by 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. That's what water does. Push it apart a little bit, melt, push it apart a little more. You really have to be careful about it. You just don't go out doing that. That's a practical thing I thought I'd just throw in. So what I, uh, we can talk about, uh, I'm going to go down and find this. I'll come back to that. I thought it right there. Darwin noticed these two problems, absence of life in the Precambrium, the Cryptozoic, and the absence of any intermediate forms. His comment on this was, until they solve these two problems, my theory will not stand. His general theory would not stand. And it has not been proven to this point. All right. So, oh man, I had all this stuff in order. What did I do here? Uh, I think I may have lost one. Well, I'm just going to have to go back to that one, and I'm going to have to read it to you. And I apologize for that, because I just need to go through the rest of this. This says, this vast period of time, or eon, includes about five-sixths of geologic time. And it gives the, the dating according to, quote, the absolute dating methods. <clears throat> but it lacks fossils suitable... Uh, for correlation, and you can't divide it into units. It's basically what they say. So without the fossils, you can't really divide it up. And that's five, six of the Earth's rocks that could have fossils in them. We're not talking about metamorphic rock that has been bent or, you know, everything's been destroyed by the bending. All right, so these are the two things, and you'll see in a minute that one I had where he had pointed that out. Tree rings and barbs and uh, spelothemes, spelothemes and corals and ice cores are all sort of local application ways of telling time. So if you go up and you go, uh, go to the uh, North Pole or you go to the South Pole, you can drill down through and take a core of that ice. And believe it or not, there's not very much snow in the North or the South you have cold, dry air falling on it. So the amount of snow that actually comes down per year is very small. And what it does is it creates these layers. And you can tell a lot from the layers, just like you can go down through the bottom of a, uh, of a, a pond that has begun to fill in. And you can tell a lot about the past ecology. <clears throat> but these are all local. Barbs are in the rocks. Um, I can't remember what spelia themes were, but they all look alike. <laughs> I forget. It's something in the rock. Corals are like that. Ice cores are like that. And so here are varves. You can see very clearly that the varves are there. You know, here are some... I uh, can't remember now whether these are... That doesn't have it on here. I want to say that that's... Uh, that's rock barbs in a different form. Here are here are some cores. I apologize, guys. I haven't done that. And they can do this pretty carefully, and they can tell you a lot about it. So they can tell you if there was uh, a warming period or a colder period. They can tell things like that, but it's all local. All right, and they can't really take one ice core and match it up with another ice core. And you can do the same thing with tree rings, you know. And those are not the same width. The spring growth and the fall growth make the ring, and you can match up the patterns in some cases, you know, knowing the, the age of the trees. 
but that's only going to take you back a few thousand years. All right, so we're back to this again. This is all based on fossil evidence, and fossil evidence is all based on how you view the fossils. Just like when you put that deck of cards back together, it all depends on how you look at the ace as to where you put it. It's up to interpretation. And only tradition has taught us to put it in a particular, you know, ace, two, three, four, five, six, jack, king, queen. Seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, king, queen. Okay, I'm no good at cards either. Okay, you got to know when to fold them. That's all I got to say. So here, here's the special theory. Here's the general theory down here. And I can't emphasize that enough. It's underlying every single thing. Darwin was very concerned about this. That far back, he recognized these two things as major problems, and they still are major problems. So I just want you to be aware of all of that. No intermediate fossils, and the fact that this cryptozoic doesn't have any fossils. They now call it the Precambrium. And every once in a while, they'll come up with something that they say is Precambrium. They say, here are microscopic fossils, okay, from the Dolomite rocks of Australia. And uh, these are older than the Cambrium. And this has exceeded, extended the, the record of life on Earth by a hundred mil a thousand million years, which is a billion. Uh, so I want you to notice that those are algae. That's microscopic. Now, I've studied algae for my, uh, for my master's, and I studied other plants for my Ph.D., and I don't know why they say those are algae. I mean, there's nothing about any of the pictures that I've seen that would make me definitively say these are algae. And the question is, are they before that layer where you have this burst? The Cambrium is where you have this explosion of species, and they're not simple. They're multicellular, they're very complex, and every phyla except for the chordates is represented in the first layers of rock. So it's like, boom, there it is. So they say this is a Precambrian fossil. So let's just grant that, that, is a, uh, that that's an algal cell. I went back and I started studying how they made a definition between Cambrium and Precambrium. What I found was if they had not found a fossil in it, it was in the Cambrium and up. And you'll laugh at this, but it's really true. But if they found a fossil below the Cambrium, then they put it in the Cambrium. And they stopped calling it Precambrium by the fact that they found the fossil there. And I know that's a fact. I went back and I checked it over and over again to see if that was the way they did it. But by definition, if they found a fossil, they basically moved it up into the Cambrian. And so, yeah, all of a sudden you have a pre-Cambrian fossil, and they keep it as something different from the Cambrian. They would normally have just moved it up. So I, I, I'm not going to say that those are algae. These things do not look like algae to me, and they're microscopic, and they're fossils. They're, you know, atom by atom replacements, but there's nothing in there that would tell me it was an algae, all right, or even bacteria. So this is what is offered up, and there's just too many questions about it that I think people have. So again, he had absence of life in the Precambrium and the absence of of the forms that were intermediate. So let's look at this again. This is how we see it in the books. So is that the way we see it? Well, Niles Eldridge uh, and uh, Stephen Jay Gould both made statements that people will say I'm taking out of context, but they were rather telling statements. And Niles Eldridge uh, made this statement. I fiddled with this to try to get it better, and I made it worse. Uh, I admit that an awful lot of fantasy has gotten into the textbooks as though it were true. For instance, the now famous example, still on exhibit downstairs, they've taken it out now, at the American Museum of Natural History, is the exhibit on horse evolution 
pre prepared perhaps 50 years ago. That has been presented as literal truth in textbook after textbook. Now I think that that's lamentable, particularly because the people who propose these kinds of stories themselves may be aware of the speculative nature of some of the stuff. And by the time it filters down to the textbooks, uh, it is science, it's presented as science as truth, and we got a problem. Sorry, I got to figure out how to make that pretty again. It's not pretty right now. So that was the first statement. And it just leaped off the page at many of us that of what he was saying, that if you have a concept of what it ought to be, then you align it that way. All right, so if you think that small horses ought to become big horses in evolution, then that's how you line them up, small to large. Now, I'm willing to say there are a bunch of species of horses. That doesn't bother me in the least. But what bothers me is that they don't tell students that. That's my biggest concern, is that they do not tell students what the evidence is and where they begin their stories and their interpretation. He clearly talks about this as a story. It filtered down into textbooks. Next thing you know, it's gospel for them. Okay? Uh, so uh, that's, that's that. Stephen Jay Gould uh, has now passed on. He was a, a, a superb scientist, but he started with the assumption, because he's an atheist, he started with the assumption that all life came from an original Big Bang, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up until what we have. And, uh, and now he's passed on. So I'm not meaning any disrespect to him. And I think you know me well enough by now to know that I'm not being disrespectful to any of my professors. We disagreed, but we talked about it. They thought I was crazy, and I thought they were wrong. But we were still friends, you know. And I think when we can learn to do that, you know, as I'm going to say it one more time, without getting hot under the collar, then we've learned something about Christianity. You know, the only time that Jesus got hot under the collar was when they came into his house. He's here tonight, you know. When they came into his house, the temple was his house as God, and they turned it into a, a bazaar. And they turned the court of the Gentiles, where Gentiles were allowed to come in and pray, they turned that part into a bazaar and made money off of it. And he threw them out of that part of the temple twice. And he had a right to, because they did it to his house. But when you stop and think about how he reacted to them when they brought the woman taken in adultery, he never even looked up from the ground. He just kept looking at the ground, I think drawing in it or something. And uh, he just spoke to them quietly. And I, I feel like that's basically how he did all of his sermons. You know, he just said, this is what's happening. And his miracles were the stamp of approval that people saw to help them understand that he was speaking for God. You know, we can do the same thing. Ultimately, we have to go back to the scriptures because that's what we have, the miracle of the scriptures. And we will be talking about uh, this important thing about how we got the Bible and how all of us, including our children, can know for a fact that what we have in our Bible is what was delivered to the apostles and prophets. No changes. You will know that it's right, and you will never worry about it again. So Stephen J. Gould, he had one of his statements. <clears throat> he said, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and the nodes of their branches, and the rest is a guess or inner, in, uh, it's supposed to be inference. That says interference, doesn't it? Well, who could have done that? I have no idea who did that. All right, only at the tips and the notes of their branches, the rest is a guess. However, reasonable, not evidence from fossils. It's not the evidence from the fossils. All right, now, 
Remember I told you about that little book called Science and Creationism, a view from the National Academy of Sciences? In the newest one, the largest section that they have is their defense of Stephen Jay Gould. Because I think sometimes people make a statement and they know it's true, and then when it gets out there, they realize what they've done and they want to take it back. Now, that's what happened to uh, Dr. Kirkcutt when he wrote that book on implications of evolution, where I've gotten my two uh, definitions for special and general evolution. When that came out in the United States, they tried to get them all back. It's kind of like that Baptist Bible where they decided to put Baptists in there and, and or baptize in there, and it turned out John the baptizer, and they tried to pull them all back. You don't find very many copies of it, all right? So anyway, um, so this is a very, very important uh, quote. And, you know, he made it and he wishes he didn't make the statement, but the statement is actually true. And I can show that to you. I do want to say one thing about Bolton David Heiser, who basically used to be an atheist and then became a Christian. This is his most famous book. And I'll come back and explain to you why he's so important to me. I guess at this point, you might have called him a creationist. I don't know whether he was actually a creationist, the way you and I are thinking about it, because I, th I think that he had the same view that I had about special evolution, all right? So he really was both. But I'll explain to you, I wanted to make sure you saw that. Here's a chart, okay? In his book, he had 51 examples within this chart. Oops, is it moving? I forgot it would do that. Let me back it up here. I'm going to I'm going to wait. It's going to move on its own. <clears throat> it's a technique. You put the timings in there and then you look really sophisticated. <laughs> don't I look sophisticated? I don't think so. Well, anyway, he had 51 quotes from the people who were the experts on particular organisms that were supposed to go to other organisms. In every case, the expert at that time stated that they could not see any way that what they were studying could have evolved to the next thing or have come from the thing before. They were the experts on those organisms. And so basically what happens is they put the chart up like this and then there's a piece taken out. That's where one of the quotes was. This is where some of the other quotes were. You start taking out the places where there's no fossils, and you just keep taking them out. He went through 51 of these things, all right? So pretty soon what you end up with is just a bunch of fragments, and how you put that together is totally up to you. So there's the evidence right there. That would be the evidence, and that would be the interpretation. So you come back to this idea of evidence and interpretation again. And it, that's just a fact. This is the facts. That's the interpretation. It has been that way. It is that way. It'll probably be in the books that way for a long time. So students really need to be aware that they're not looking at the evidence when they look at that chart. And it's all drawn with the solid lines. It's just not true. All right. Uh, and I, I got to tell you, I think there's just an awful lot of biologists in their specialties. They know a lot, but are they're probably not aware of this. You know, they they function using evolution as a single word. They've been they've been influenced by the special theory of evolution examples which we can see in a lab or we can see in the field. And they've just accepted that they're all connected in the same way. Like I said with the genetics, the idea of genetic change with no limits, that would be what they put behind the general theory. But, you know, breeders and experiments have shown that there are limits every time. So that was my point, putting that up. There are no transitional fossils. And then, of course, they're going to bring up Archaeopteryx. 
That's another big word, and I hope I impressed you. Archaeopteryx is this reptile bird, supposedly the common ancestor, and this is pretty much the only thing that'll ever be brought up to show a transitional fossil. So I did some studying on it myself, <coughs> and this is it. Now, how, how big do you, do you picture Archaeopteryx when you're thinking about it? You were probably talking about it. Weren't you talking about it at dinner? Have you ever, if, if you've ever seen this, have you ever, did you have a concept about how big it was? Size of a pigeon. You know, most people are thinking about something that has 15 foot wingspan, you know, and breathes fire. This is it. This is the, this is the skeleton. There's only one other right there. Squash flat. Looks like roadkill. And I'm not meaning to be funny. It just looks like roadkill. Okay. So you look at it and all of the things that they got, they got out of this. And we'll look at it the way it's drawn in a minute. All right. The idea of feathers. There, for that, there has to be another impression. There has to be a rock on top that has the, the, the negative of this. And the British Museum will not let anybody see these at all. Nobody has a right to go and see these. This picture is all people have been working with all this time. You know, it just seems like if you're just, if you're just going to say, yeah, we have the other piece of the evidence, but we're not going to let you know, it's kind of like the king's new clothes. It's... You don't, you don't have it. You just don't have it. So anyway, this is this is what it looked like, size of a pigeon. And this is how it's drawn in the textbooks for the students. Now, I don't care if they put their interpretation in a book. I just really would like to see a sixth grader or a fifth grader know that that's not what they have. What they, what they have is that squash thing. Now, there are some differences in this particular organism that are reptilian. There are some characteristics that are reptilian. There's no doubt about that. All right, so this is a, this is a pigeon. It has a single hole in its head for the eye. Reptiles have more than one hole in their skull. Pigeons have this, these fused vertebrae, they have this breastbone, you know, all of this is different and reptiles, come out, they have claws, this has claws, and down straight, long tail, they don't have a, a breastbone, and there's some other things that are not there. Okay, so you, there are actually differences between the two. Now, to me, you're ignoring the very obvious idea that perhaps there was just something like this that was its own species. It's hard, you know, how can you tell if something's a species if you do not know anything about their habits, how they breed, where they lived, et cetera, et cetera. So you, what they're doing is they're filling in the things based on the current thinking, which is general evolutionary thinking. So uh, I want to talk about that. Oh, this is the other one they found right here. All right. Now, some people get off on a different tangent here, and they go after it and they say this is a fraud because it was found at a time when uh, there were Chinese and people where these things were being uh, found, uh, this, lots of fossils were being found, who, who carved these and they, they passed them off as fossils, that the feathers don't follow the same patterns if you look at them close enough. I'm going to grant that this was an organism that lived. I'm perfectly happy with that. But I think it was an organism that lived and it was unique. I don't think it was in between. And I'll show you why. Uh, now, th this is what they've drawn from what you just saw, okay? Uh, they've cleaned it up considerably. This is how it was in my textbook when I got it from... Uh, when I got the Hickman book. This is a, a zoology book. Not only are the feathers there, but it's all color. You would not have a clue. There's no way that you could do this. 
It's kind of like when you think about the fossils, think about those x-rays you've had taken. What color is the hair of the last one? Can you tell the color of somebody's hair from their x-ray? You, you can tell a little bit of racial characteristics, and you can tell uh, whether it's male or female, and that's about it. You know, and that's what they're doing. They're pulling just the bones. They don't have anything else. No, no brains, no hearts, no intestines. They don't have any of that stuff. All right, and that becomes important at a different time in this. So the question is, how did a reptile become a bird? So I want you to think about it. There's a lot of things about birds that are unique that I'm going to have to skip over. All right, their circulatory system, their respiratory system, Birds actually get oxygen when they breathe in and when they breathe out. Wouldn't that be handy? You know, if you were a runner, you would be happy. Okay. But what I want to focus on is this, this whole thing about the, the major muscles in, in the arm. First of all, the breastbone and the breast meat is all there because the muscles that pull the wings up and the muscles that pull the wings down are all on the breast. Now for us, when I go this way, it's all of these muscles. When I go this way, it's all on my back. All right, so I want you to keep that in your mind, okay? Because that's, that's the one I want to focus on. I, I have a lot of stuff. The other thing I want you to think about is here's eagle bone and here's human bone. What's the difference? Yeah, it has all sorts of holes or cavities in it. Right, almost looks like osteoporosis. All right, what this does is it lightens that bird. Okay, this is the way all reptile bones are. It's kind of like us. So there's a few changes that are going to have to take place here, plus some behavioral things. So let's go to that. So here we have this little hummingbird, a really amazing kind of thing. All right, they can fly backwards and I just they I have lots of hummingbirds. I love my hummingbirds. All right. So what we have here is we have up and down, all right, and it's all on one side. And there's a little pulley that goes over the bone there to redirect the the pulling up. Okay. And that's basically it. Now what's the implication of this? Well, what I want to do is talk to you about what you think would happen. And it's hard to know how much of a change you can allow, but birds are born, they come from eggs, they're sitting in a nest. And how different could one of those baby birds be before it was thrown out of the nest by the mother or the siblings? I mean, what kind of a change would be tolerated? Would all the feathers being gone be tolerated? Nah, probably wouldn't get away from that snake either. All right, so between predators and the way organisms act in their little families, kind of, this would either have been thrown out of the nest by the mother. Uh, it would not be able to compete. The mother would not feed it as opposed to feeding the others that were normal. So what? how big of a difference would you have? Because ultimately, you have to change the feathers into scales, the scales into feathers for a reptile, right? You have to change those scales to a feather. And so if you start thinking about it, even if you grant that the mother would allow it to be there, all right, as it began to change and it doesn't have scales anymore, you have the problem of what was the purpose of the scales? What is the purpose of the scales? Why do snakes have scales? It's for protection, usually in very dry climates. It helps hold water in, but mostly it's protection, isn't it? So you got a bird, I mean a reptile, that is now getting rid of its scales and little tiny feathers are coming out. I don't know how much of a feather, I don't know how much of a change you could you could actually make <clears throat> so at what point does that thing not die well, i'm going to i'm going to grant that it gets through that it actually turns every scale there's a feather there now 
But the problem is that feathers have their own circulatory system, each feather, and they have their own nervous system, and they have a control box that tilts each feather. It is an amazing system of connected nerves and uh, the ability to, to tilt those feathers when they need to do. Now, that means that you have to change all the morphology from a reptile morphology to a bird morphology. You have to change scales into feathers. You have to keep it alive while all of this is happening. You have to take all the muscles off the back of the reptile and put them on the front with a pulley system. Now that's not something that you can do gradually. It's just either got to be there or not there, or it's not going to be a bird or a reptile. It's just going to die. So we're going to say that it stays in the nest. We're going to say that the siblings don't kill it. The mother doesn't kill it. Predators don't kill it. It takes all the scales, makes them into feathers. The feathers then take on their own circulatory system, their own nervous system, and a control system. There has to be a control system there, like a big computer system for it. All right, well, let's just say that all of that happened. And eventually you get something that used to be a reptile that looks like a bird, okay? However, it doesn't know to fly, does it? At what, at what point do you find this thing actually knowing it can fly? And the, I think people just miss some of the most amazing things. They are so different, you can't even comprehend it. And that's why I believe that scientists are just as bad about using their faith once they get something in their head as we are. Now, I, I'm not going to ever be able to prove that uh, that the creation happened over evolution in the sense of scientific proof. I can show you different ways to look at it. But I ultimately have to believe on faith. It's just a faith. There is a God. You know, I mean, there is a God. I can't explain this. It's like this one friend of mine who's a psychiatrist. And, and he said, well, you know, one day I was just sitting in the house this guy used to be a NASA, uh, NASA examining moon rocks. Then he decided he'd go back, become a doctor. Then he decided to become a psychiatrist. And then he had another specialty on top of that. He's brilliant. What can I say? It's wise, my friend. But anyway, <laughs> he, I make him look better. <laughs> That's the key. Uh, anyway, he just said he was looking out the window and he looked at a flower and it just hit him the magnificence of the structure of that flower. You know, with flowers and living things, the farther down you look at them with microscopes, the more intricate they become. If you take an electron microscope and you look at the end of a pin, it, it looks gullied. <laughs> the sharpest pin you've ever felt going in your arm by that nurse who hit the bone. The sharpest pin you've ever seen looks rough at a certain magnification. But the stinger on a wasp just gets more sharp and more sharp, and the detail is all very clear, and it just gets even more intricate as you go down. And that's the way life is. The farther you go down, you can buy the best artificial flower that anybody makes that, that even from this close looks like a flower. But when you start looking at it with a microscope, it doesn't take long to see that's not a flower. There's no intricacy there. There's no life in it. And, and I think that what happens is I have my faith. It, it is the substance of something that I'm hoping for. And it is the evidence of things I've never seen before. But when I, when I was a general evolutionist, never an atheist, but probably an agnostic, you know, I had my own faith. And what I've said all along in my presentations is, 
I can't prove it scientifically. I can talk about the special theory of evolution scientifically because you can see it, you can test it, okay? You can watch the results. But the rest of it is all taken on faith. And sometimes scientists will say, I believe on the basis of facts and you believe on the basis of faith. And that is the huge lie, whether they recognize they're saying it or not. They get to a certain point. They are. They have just as strong a faith. You know, in essence, they're born again atheists many times. I haven't met very many people who are theistic evolutionists in the sciences anymore. They pretty much are all non-believers in any way. They're atheists. I have a number of friends who were in my department who grew up uh, in congregations just like this, who have now just thrown it all away. You know, and it's because they've adopted another faith system. And that's what this is all about. So I hope, I hope you understand what I'm trying to do. I want you to see how this stuff is added to the evidence. These theories are added on to the evidence. And it shows up shows up in the drawings and the illustrations. And it's important for all, for us and our our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren that we teach them how to make a distinction in that. You know, and that's one of my major points here. And the other thing is that you've got three theories of evolution, one of which is compatible with what the Bible teaches and can be observed. And then you have two that have never been observed. And you're going to have to take them on faith. Now, that faith is not as broad as my faith. What the Bible teaches me is something about every aspect of my life. If God made my body, then God should be able to tell me how to live in it. That's bothersome to many of us in the American culture. <clears throat> we think of ourselves as rugged individualist. You know, we can do it on our own. And uh, the truth is, as I told you before, most of us would never have made it to the age where we were if we were born in the 1800s. Our genetics were just not that good. Our ancestors were survivors. But it wasn't because of them. And many of them saw so much heartache and sorrow that I think they recognized God more easily than us. You know, when you are watching life and death in your own family over and over again, you know, with half of your brothers and sisters dying before they reach the age of 10, it gives you a different perspective. When you are growing your own food from the land, you know, it's not coming in by a truck that goes to the grocery store and you go to the grocery store in a car that is run by uh, fossil fuels. You know, you got on a horse, you got in a carriage, you got on a wagon, you went about two miles down to the store to where people had put their produce together and you bought what you needed. I mean, it, it there were no good old days. You are living in the good old days right now. There are no good old days. This is the best it's ever been. We have more than any other people on the face of the earth. We really need to understand that because we take it all so much for granted. Now, I've, I've tried to go through the fossil record without poking fun at anybody, but the point is, it's a faith issue. Fossils don't tell you anything until you decide how you're going to look at them. If you decide to look at them as representing general evolution, then it's not a surprise that you arrange the rocks that way. And then it becomes a matter of circular reasoning. And I had, I've had geologists tell me that a lot. I, I say, well, how do you know how old this rock is? Well, by, by, the, uh, by the fossil that's in it. Well, how do you know the fossil's that old? Well, by the rock I found. It. It's that kind of circular reasoning. So I'm not trying to poke fun at anybody. I just want you to see, to the best of my ability, evidence and interpretation in here. And I hope that I've done that for you tonight. I appreciate you all sitting uh, through this again. You all have been very patient with me.
Five questions. If you have to leave, please do not feel bad about getting up and leaving. All right. If you're angry with me, I would like you to come to me at some point and say, I don't like, uh, are you angry with me? <laughs> now, this is not the question's comment. You talk about the reptile turning to the bird right in the desk. All they've done is 28 days. <coughs> hmm? uh, chicken or a oh. bird may hatch in 28 days. Yeah, well, lots of organisms are much faster than that. I mean, the life the lifespan of a fly is two days. So, the, but the point is, if you have a population of these things, they're going to have different genetics, and one of them is always going to be different. So the question.